Topics Pandalam. As we all know, today we are gathered here for the 11th lecture series of RRR, that is Reading, Rereading and Reconstructing. First of all, I would like to welcome our respected principal, Professor Dr. M.G. Sunil Kumar in absentia to this program. I would also like to welcome our respected HOD, Dr. Anjana J. to this event. Now, I am profoundly delighted to take this opportunity to welcome our honorable chief guest for today's session. She is none other than Kavita Kane, an Indian writer and former journalist who is known for writing mythology fiction. We are grateful to you, ma'am, for accepting our invitation for being the chief guest for today's event. I extend a affable welcome to you, ma'am. Now, I welcome the PG students who has organized this event and the teacher coordinators, Harita R. Unditan, Lakshmi Prasannan and Revati S. to this session. I also extend a gracious and inclusive welcome to all our beloved teachers and students who have gathered here today. Here we gather not only as audience but as explorers in the realm of knowledge. So with gratitude for your presence and excitement for the intellectual exploration that lies ahead, together let us lend our ears to Kavida Kane musing on her new novel, Tara's Dreams. Thank you, Jwala, for your words. Before we move on to our guest, I would love to welcome our HOD, the guiding light, Dr. Anjana J, to share with us a few words of wisdom. Uh, thank you, Jwala. Uh, good evening, uh, respected principal in absentia. Uh, guest of honor, Srimadi uh, Kavita Kane, all the participants from across uh, India, my dear colleagues and my dear students, a very warm good evening to one and all. Uh, the Department of English, NSS College Pandalam, is back with yet another edition of our lecture series, RRR. Today, the department is extremely privileged and delighted to have a renowned author amongst us this evening. Thank you so much, ma'am, for having given your consent to join us today. Mythological rereading has been a potent area in which uh, the readers would get an opportunity uh, to have multiple perspectives of various characters. It also gives voice to a number of uh, character, voiceless uh, characters who were just shadows behind their mighty fathers or husbands in the mythological stories. Srimadhi Kavita Kane has been very successful in portraying various women characters from an altogether different perspective. For example, um, characters like Uruvi, wife of Karna, Umla, uh, wife of Lakshmana, Shupanaga, uh, Ravan's sister, and the latest one, Thara, wife of Vali, or, and later that of uh, Sugreev. Her narrative skill is so enthralling uh, that it glues the reader to the pages of the book. Thank you once again, ma'am, for uh, joining us today. And I request all the participants to use this opportunity to the maximum because you are having one of the best read uh, writers of our times amongst us this evening. May we all have a very fruitful evening today. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for your inspiring words. Now it's time to welcome our guest to the session. For that, I invite B.S. Deva to take over. Good evening everyone. I am Deva representing first year MA English. It is both an honor and a source of enthusiasm to introduce our distinguished guest today, the multifaceted individual Kavita Kani, a senior journalist, columnist and a revolutionary force in Indian writing. She has left an indelible mark in the dreams of literature and journalism. Born and raised in Mumbai, she embarked on her journey fueled by insatiable curiosity and a passion for storytelling. Her academic pursuits led her to Ferguson College, Pune, where she completed her degree and later the University of Pune, where she earned post-graduation degrees in both English literature and mass communication. Her career in journalism took off with insightful reporting and dedication, quickly garnering attention. She contributed significantly to various media houses including Magna Publications, Daily News and Analysis and the Times of India. Transitioning seamlessly into the world of literature, 
Kavita Kani emerged as a compelling author with a series of acclaimed novels woven with vibrant threads of mythology, history and personal narratives. Each of her works tell a story of love, loss, resilience and the enduring power of human spirit. Her debut work, The Karna's Wife, The Outcast's Kune, captivated readers with its poignant narrative and gained widespread acclaim. This success paved the way for subsequent literary triumphs including Sita's Sister, Menaka's Choice, Ahalya's Awakening, Sarasadi's Gifts, Tara's Truths, etc. Each a testament to her storytelling powers and the ability to transport readers to ancient kingdoms, weaving tales of courage, sacrifice and the unwearing strength of women. Her stories act as portals to different worlds, reasoning with universal themes that touch our hearts and minds. So without further delay, on behalf of the PG Department of English, NSS College Pandala, it's my proud privilege to welcome our chief guest Kavita Kani and Meera Premkumar of First PG English for the conversation. Good evening everyone. I'm Meera from First May English. Thank you all for joining us today. I'm really excited to be here with Kavita Kane, the acclaimed author of Tara's Truce. Kavita Ma'am has not only captivated readers with a mesmerizing storytelling, but also has a fascinating career trajectory, starting as a journalist and transitioning to an author of fiction. So before we dive into your latest book, Ma'am, I would like to ask you this. What sparked this transition from a journalist to a full-time writer? Uh, first and foremost, let me thank you all for inviting me. And I'm very much looking forward for this conversation. and. Uh, Hope we'll all have a good time. Uh, so coming back to your question about, uh, can you hear me properly? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, my journey from a journalist to a writer, I think it was more by default, honestly. Let me be very honest about this. Uh, I think every journalist wants to write a book eventually. He hopes to write a book. and. Uh, it happened with me too and uh, after 20 years in journalism i was just you know sort of contemplating and i think my mother sort of egged me on to eventually she used to say oh there's so many bylines why don't you write a book i mean she used to keep uh, sort of every time i went visited my mother in goa i used to this was a favorite conversation we had so i said okay it was more of a challenge and I said, okay, let me do one book. And uh, that's how Karna's Wife came about. And when I decided to write Karna's Wife, the whole thing was, uh, I didn't want to write nonfiction because I was writing a lot of nonfiction when I was doing my career. In journalistic writing is basically all dates and data and uh, being extremely objective. Uh, so I wanted to get away from that and do something which I really want to. It was actually a more of a personal test. So. I said, let me do write a novel because besides my name, there's nothing poetic about me. So definitely not poetry. So it was a novel. And I decided on mythology as a genre because I think being a literature student, I knew how mythology was actually a literary tool. You know, it's a, besides it becomes a platform to sort of retell any story or uh, color the uh, present canvas with a certain modern sensibility. I think uh, more than anything, it provides an extremely creative and liberal uh, literary technique for an author, where he has considerable freedom, not only of, of everything, right, from structure, plot, narrative, language, I think. So it was mythology I decided. and. Um, what better way than the stories of Ramayana and Mahabharata? And initially, I started off with I wanted to write a Urmila actually. That was my first story idea. But she was one character which completely fascinated me. But after I did my research, I realized there was nothing about her. And I think I, I, courage just left me. I said I didn't have the, definitely didn't have the guts to write a book on her. So the next favorite character was Karna. And Karna, again, I wanted, I didn't want him telling his own story. I wanted a more women's perspective, you know, a story which his mother would tell or his wife would tell. And the whole character about his wife, then I had to create a fictitious character called Uri because I didn't want to tamper with either Vrishali, who was his wife, and uh, 
he had other wives but i said let me create a character who would uh be his conscience who would be his sutradhar sort of his would tell his story and uh, more importantly a person who could mix around with him in every way in the sense not only as his wife his friend his lover as i said his conscience but a, a person physical person who could be part of the political intrigue who could be with him in the court who would be uh, socially acceptable because of his definite uh, social status lower social status i needed a wife who could be who could question let's say a bhishma kunti and arjun or duryodhan you know so she should have enough she should be in a politically strong position to be his wife not only to be his wife more important to be part of the hastinapur court so that's how urvi was created and uh, that book happened and it became a it was extremely popular it became a sleeper hit and i think the success of that book was sort of a turning point where when the publishers came with the second book they said will you write another book for him uh, for us so that was the time i actually wondered whether i should continue with journalism as a career or take to full time writing and i decided to take to full time writing because i realized i enjoyed this much more in the sense i was quite i think i had sort of stagnated in my journalist career because i did what i wanted i was already an editor and i could see and after 10 years i would just continue being an editor nothing beyond that so i thought okay fine let's see and the first book was a success so it became a challenge each book became a challenge for me so i think that's how the journey actually started after one book then came i think as i said the kakare which had deserted me the first time i think i sort of managed to gather it back again and write about urmila so that's how sita sister came about and then i think all the books followed one by one for some reason or the other i think that's another long story i think there's a story about each of them though that becomes too tedious i think so we're glad to hear that ma'am and uh, let me ask you this all your works are focused on women characters like shurpana kha urmila satyavati then why do you choose women to be your central characters because i think honestly women should tell women story we need to hear more of a story because we when we talk about the epics we think of the men first besides sita and dropadi who are the protagonists female protagonists of the epics you always think of ram ravan karna arjun krishna is always the men who come to your mind collective mind first not the belly the women and there are equal number of women as much as the men but we tend to overlook them for some reason or the other because i think these are being stories told written by men told by men sort of passed down by men and uh, we have a very male perspective you know about the entire story so what about the women so i just curious so it started as i said it started off with urvi so, um, that's how the whole uh, sorry i got got interrupted that's why uh the question was sorry i mean i think that's the whole thing women being the central character uh, yes yeah, so i think that the whole thing is about uh, you know when a woman becomes the central character it changes the entire perspective it's like we see her we see the wife we see the mother we see a woman's point of view not just as a mother wife sister whatever so whether let's say urmila who is sita sister who is lakshman's wife who is janak's daughter but we see ramayan that particular that particular story as a uh, mm, story in the palace we really don't know what happened in the palace when these three people left what happened to urmila no? the original valmiki is urmila makes a sleep for 40 years i sort of took it as a metaphorical thing and said that she sort of wakes up from that sleep and she has her own private exile where she lives a life without her husband and what happens in the palace with these three young girls and three queens so that's it so it happened uh, so the women as i said why why women characters because i think uh, um, women definitely are more interesting it 
it gives them a wider scope you know there's a wider scope of society it's more layered when uh, when you come to know the same thing through a woman so i'm sorry uh, this is like the same story when you see because you see that that entire story in a very different uh, in not only a different perspective you see a different conclusion you see a different uh, narrative you see uh, literally a, a, when a story is seen and told from a woman's point of view how she interprets it how she interpreted a certain incident or an episode which happened and the way a man interprets it, like let's say talk let's say about war you know, let's talk about something war which was something a universal fact at that time how did it how did the women react to it how it affected the women i think even in taras too i think that's a very major theme where uh, we are talking about war and glory even the death is glorious but uh, uh, can i pause for a minute i think there's some urgent sure. yeah Sorry. So uh, uh, again, this uh, or if you see the character, let's say of Saraswati, and then I'm talking specifically of women character. Now we talk about goddesses, but I think Saraswati again is sort of when we talk about Durga, we talk about Parvati, we talk about Lakshmi. But Saraswati is one goddess which we do not talk about. Talk about when we see more uh, definitely sort of been sidelined in modern society, and more than important, I think the whole imp uh, the synonymous thing of women and intelligence, you know, women and knowledge, is very ironical that you know everything about is women. Lakshmi is the goddess of wealth. Uh, the goddess of intelligence. It's, it's a woman everywhere. It's, it's the woman who uh, is the goddess of wealth. It's a woman who is the goddess of uh, knowledge. It is the Shakti who is again Parvati. So when these three important factors have been sort of ruled by women, why are we not seeing these stories through the women's eyes? So now these are goddesses. I think Saraswati uh, gift was the first book which uh, dealt with goddesses as such. But my other seven books were about lesser mortal when they were mortal they were but i think that's very much true in our daily lives we don't see life or even experiences through a woman we don't it's always everything we don't it's such an unconscious thing we see everything uh, even a vocabulary a language everything is extremely male dominated so i think women character why I choose women character because i think they are very they are they, it is a fact that we are a neglected uh, there are two species, men and women. And I think women have been neglected or sort of overlooked of, through history. And their stories need to be told. I mean, if there are that many women in our epics, why, why, why don't we know more about them besides Sita and Draupadi? Why don't we know more about Gandhari? Why don't we know more about Shabri? Why don't we know more about Mandodri or Tara? You know, so I think uh, I wanted to tell, one day honestly, I wanted to tell the, the stories of these women who have been sort of hidden in the shadows and I sort of wanted to put a spotlight on them and let people see them, give them a voice. And, you know, because when they have a voice, they will ask questions, they want answers. So I think uh, from a sideline character to become the protagonist, uh, this whole, that's how the entire story develops. So a woman, it is completely a woman's story by a woman, for a woman. Uh, I think for the men also, because I think I, 
I hope the men also actually love my story because I think my male characters are equally strong. But here, more than Lakshman, I was interested in Urmila. More than uh, Saraswati, more than Brahma, I was interested in Saraswati. So uh, this whole thing of uh, the women dominating the scene was there. Thank you, ma'am. Great answer, by the way. Then your works have subverted many pre-existing perceptions about certain characters. And has this influenced the reception and critique of your books? Since in our society, religion and myth are really important and they are considered almost the same. So has this influenced the reception of your works? Uh, I didn't catch your question. Uh, your works have uh, subverted many pre-existing perceptions about certain characters. Mm -hmm. And has this influenced the reception and critique of your work? No, can you give me an instance? Can you sort of give a proper example of this? Yeah, like in your uh, one of your interviews on YouTube, I saw a comment where somebody has commented that you should not interfere with religion, uh, mm -hmm. you should stay away from that. So uh, has that influenced the reception of your work? No, um, I mean, you're asking me about the feedback? how the feedback affects, how I'm affected by the feedback. Yes, uh, honestly, uh, I, um, feedback is something, honestly, which I cannot control in the sense, I do not know how people would react to a book. But yes, I definitely see this after a point, uh, you have to realize it is fiction. But when these stories are not my stories, these characters are not mine, they're all borrowed characters, these are all borrowed stories, but the interpretation is mine. So just like I have interpreted the story in a certain way, it might be not liked by some. So as an author, I have to accept that. So that I have, once I accept that, I think um, I try to stick to the original uh, story and uh, the feedback uh, up till now has been okay. It's not been that, uh, what do you say, fiery, uh, very anti, there's not been much, much of an uh, animosity towards what uh, I have written. Um, and I have tackled a lot of the sensitive issue. So I think there's some net problem. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, 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 ma'am. Yeah, yeah. So, um, up till now, I mean, though I have tackled a lot of uh, fragile issues, uh, they have, I think, I respect my readers a lot. And I find them extremely mature and discerning. And uh, they've been able to understand what I've been trying to say. I mean, even in Tara's shoes, I mean, there were definite uh, instances where I had, uh, where I had to, you know, it depends on how you treat the subject also. So knowing, they might like people always ask me this question that in this today's time there's so much of controversy going on so much that the backlashes are more frequent and more fiery uh but i just say that i'll i write as honestly as i can and i try to i, I sincerely hope that the readers also and uh, comprehend what i'm trying to say because especially uh, in this book and even in Saraswati's groups, which I think tackled a lot of issues. Uh, there were a lot of delicate issues and what do you say, uh, uh, issues where uh, uh, there's a lot of, uh, what do you say, social thought and uh, 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 sort of uh, action reaction involved. But uh, I think I had confidence in my readers that they would understand. They would, they are definitely there's a committee, there's perfect communication between author and editor. So feedback, yes, I mean, there are some people, I mean, I can't expect 100% uh, uh, applause every time. But yes, there's feedback, but then I, I, as, a, as an author, I have to accept it because sometimes you learn from the feedback also. You might be going, might have gone wrong somewhere or I might have, you know, something like vocab, vocabulary, you don't realize that you have used one word very often and then some feedback comes that, okay, you know, uh, this author has used this word. So these sort of things, you know, things we, we, we might, uh, have overlooked uh, the authors tend to overlook because we are writing about a lack of words so so that is yeah. uh, so i think uh, feedback yes but uh, whether it's positive or negative of course positive is always welcome but negative is fine too great to hear ma'am no. it's, it's in the sense uh, it's a learning lesson for an author also yeah 
Now, uh, coming to Tara's stores, uh, can you tell us about the character of Tara? I think I'll leave it to the readers. I, try, I, try, I tried my best to keep it, uh, to, to say what I wanted to say, because I think the best uh, feedback I got actually about Tara was, I was very scared when I wrote this book that many people did not know about Tara, who Tara was actually. But the response I got was, because they did not know much about Tara, I think the curiosity was more pronounced and more peaked. So I think it worked uh, as an advantage for me. Because honestly, no one knows about Tara. She is, of course, everyone knows she is a panch kanya. But for me, I think she was a classic victim of war, violence, and ego, male ego. So I'll just put it in a nutshell. I mean, how she becomes uh, not only a bone of contention, she becomes also a prize trophy. She also becomes, OK, it's very easy. We always tend to blame the wars on women. But if she's supposed to have started a war, she also ended a war. So you know, that sort of a thing. So I think Tara Inska, she is sort of symbolic of when you're talking about a typical triangle, two men and a woman. It's not only about that. It's more about the importance of, uh, uh, what do you say, the power play, you know? And more than the power play, the egos, the male egos, how, how to handle the male egos. Uh, the two flaws, the two men in her life, and the two flaws, how it affects her life. So I think that is that's a, coming back to what I had said earlier, was that how men and their decision affect a woman's life, which is there in today's, I mean, it happened the other way around too. But since they were a more, definitely played a more dominant role that time, how it affected the women in the house, in the, in the community, in the society, I think uh, that is sort of exemplified by what Tara lived. Why is this retelling of Tara's story important now? I think, uh, honestly, Tara's story is the story of Kishkin. We suddenly see Kishkin only when, when you see Sugri, but the backstory that Wali and Tara gave. I think it's an extremely important lesson. So that actually, uh, Raman, if you see geographically, there there is uh, Mithila, there is Ayodhya, there is Kishkin, there is Lanka. All of them, besides being geographically different, they are culturally very different also. So I think what Tara's story is the story of Kishkin, the story of surrender, the story of subjugation. And how in the, the story, in surrender and subjugation, there is no loss. It's not necessarily a defeat. It can also be a win. So I think uh, Tara, when you're talking vis-a-vis uh, -vis Wali and Sugri, as the wife and the queen of, wife of Wali and the queen of Sugri, uh, she's actually, her story, it's a parallel to Kishkin's story. And we don't see Kishkin. Like I try to make Kishkin a, a character too, you know, it's, it's a forest. But the life, the rules, of the forest are very different from the rules of say Ayodhya or of, of society, of man society. So I think culturally it was very different from uh, Ayodhya, Africa, and Mithila was of course there. But even Lanka, Lanka is more materialistic, it's more flamboyant. So Kishkinde is a more down to earth, more uh, hard, more, you know, where everything is you have to fight for what you have to get. It's an extremely, uh, let's say, elementary. Uh, struggle, elementary questions, uh, almost to the point of being existential, where uh, that is how life in a jungle is. So I think Tara, when she moves, she's a, a healer's daughter. She herself becomes a healer. And a healer in Uzabi, she's contrasted to the life of war and violence the two men sort of uh, drag her into. So I think the story of Tara could be very much the story of uh, any everyday woman, where, uh, as I said, how the decisions of certain men, it, it it sort of spills over on the decision, on the life of a woman. I mean, it's definitely Tara's, the whole thing is, I mean, she's sort of almost defined by what Wali and Sugri do. So I think that isn't it, it isn't very much true today. I mean, it, it still happens. It's very much prevalent. And, uh, 
how she fights it. I mean, that, that is a fight. So the here the concept is not about whether you're winning the battle or not. The idea is the woman has to fight it. The, her strength lies in the conviction to not to face the problems which are going to come, which she sees uh, the consequences which she's going to face uh, with a certain conviction and courage. And uh, it cannot be sort of said by that it's a win or a defeat. The win is the strength lies in that she's battling it out, that she has the strength and the courage to fight it out. And she does not succumb. So I think that is the story of every woman today. That's very true, ma'am. And in Tara's truth, there are many characters who face certain difficult situations with complex moral implications. So how do you approach such dilemmas in your writing? Uh, so dilemmas in my? And these moral implications of these characters, the situations they are in. How do you mm -hmm. handle such situations in your writing? See, honestly, as I said, I try to incorporate as much of a contemporary sensibility in from these old age old stories, you know. Uh, you know, it, it, I did it with Saraswati's gift also. Where uh, I think when you talk, when I'm telling it, the story of a Tara or a Saraswati or even Satya, any story, any women I have a protagonist have written about is try to I try to write about problems which are very much present today. And I think all the present uh, problems are very much present. Like let's say Urmila's problem. Uh, Urmila's problem, the story of Urmila and Lakshman is the story of not love but separation. It's a long distance uh, relationship, which is so prevalent today. I mean, and the problems of those relationships, you know, it's on a, on a very, very matter of fact, uh, at the first, this thing we can say Urmila and uh, uh, Lakshman have that sort of a relationship, which is can be definitely modern in the sense that so actually if you see no, nothing has changed the emotions are the same the experiences are the same you just talk about love hate loyalty intrigue anger jealousy hate revenge all of this is there and and all the complication and the complexity of any relationship whether whether it be, whether it be husband wife brothers mother son mother daughter I think all of them are very much relevant, and I try to sort of uh, flesh them out as really as I can. Like I think uh, one thing I definitely like to say here is that even in the story of Tara and Ruma, I tried this whole narrative of women being women's enemy. I don't, I don't believe in that at all. I seriously believe it's a very convenient narrative which has been sort of thrust upon us and we've started believing that, that a woman's worst enemy is a woman. No, I think a woman's worst enemy is the patriarchy, which is a thought. A woman, women can be patriarchal just like men can be. So I don't think women per se are women's enemy. Uh, and I've tried to exemplify every time. I mean, I try to throw it like, even they say Saraswati Lakshmi, they always are, they are rivals and they keep fighting and squabbling. In my book, I said no, because without Saraswati, Lakshmi cannot happen, and without Lakshmi, Saraswati. No, so it is, it has to be a symbiotic relationship. But then I think women help women. I really believe that because I think uh, I'd say it from my personal experience because whoever has helped me in my life has been women in my life, whether it's my mother, whether it's my colleagues, whether it's my health, whether it's my sisters, or now whether it's my daughter. It's always the women who have helped me. So I be seriously believe, oh, my, my, my mother-in-law, uh, uh, we didn't, uh, I didn't really, I mean, she passed away before we got married, but whatever I knew of my mother, I mean, in fact, I got married because of my mother-in-law, so that's a different issue. But what I'm trying to say is that this whole thing of women being women's worst enemy is something I try to uh, reiterate, I try to say that, no, it's not true. So I, even in this book, Tara and Rumba relationship, I think, they are not best of friends, but they understand each other, you know, and that is so important. Once that empathy is there between two women, I'm not even talking about sympathy, I'm talking about empathy, then the concept of sisterhood comes. So I think I strongly believe in sisterhood and I try to bring it in every book of mine because I believe in it and I think it is true. We tend, again, we try, tend to have uh, overlooked this issue completely as uh, just like we talk about the four brothers in the Ramayana, the Ram, we talk about 
Vavali and Suguri, we talk about again the, the three brothers in Lanka. We forget about the four sisters. And not only the four sisters, we forget about how Sita, with her relationship with every woman whom she met along the way, helped her, make her strong, make her, you know, it helped her evolve as a woman from a girl. She was a girl and from a girl to a woman. The person who helped her were the women. She meets her, she meets her. She meets her. Not much, she doesn't need much. But where were all the women she met during her entire journey, it's 14 years? That is also a story of sisters. So I think this is something again which is a sort of a layered uh, this sort of has been buried in a, uh, under the heft of the uh, let's say uh, the major uh, the main uh, narrative as such but i sincerely believe that uh, the reason why all the women are there populating epics is because of this that they have the story they need to be told and i think the story of sisterhood and each of them tells the story of sisterhood I mean, I think without Shabri, how would Ram come to know about Ishkinda or Hanuman? You know, this whole thing of it's, uh, the women have always, there is, and I think we have sort of uh, underestimated the importance of women in this, uh, in these, uh, in the epic. So I think whatever stories which I try to tell, is try to bring it to contemporary thing. I'm just trying to pull those old stories into our world by saying that that is definitely there, it's still there. And we just, uh, tend to ignore it and we're almost blind to it. So ma'am, you have created your characters, but you have stayed within the established narrative. And uh, has that created any challenges while you were uh, forming the plot for Tara's truce? Yeah, honestly, Tara was such a nebulous character for me because as I said, there's nothing much about her. Even in Panjkanya, she's one of the most... Uh, the least mentioned in the sense that not so i had to completely draw her character through uh let's say i came to know she's Sushin's daughter who was a healer then through wali you know who is another very enormous character through the character let's say sugri and the two important episodes which are there with her one is of course her argument with lakshman you know she sort of persuades him she actually it shows a craftsmanship her entire uh, as a wise statesman, it comes where she actually diffuses a situation and his anger by uh, uh, she's protecting Sugri and she diffuses a near death uh, situation, a war in Kishkin by her argument. This is one uh, episode, and the second one is Ram's curse, where she uh, curses Ram. Now she is defined by these two incidents. That's all about, that's all we know about Tara. So, completely framing a skeleton, entire fleshing out a character through this, just two episodes uh, was, uh, yes, there was a lot of fiction, but the fiction was sort of not false. So there was no, it was more dramatized. You know, I tried to show, I mean, if this, uh, the two, uh, two brothers who were so close, why did they become rivals? There has to be a reason. It can't be just be plain jealousy. If there is jealousy, what is the jealousy? Is it a sibling jealousy right from childhood over what? You know, there has to be some reason. Suddenly brothers don't turn against each other. It has to be either money, something, some, there has to be a reason. So, I think when you try, it, is, it happened with Surpana also. You know, any story, you just try to uh, sort of uh, rewind the stories and try to find out what it could be. So I think um, it's more behind the scene work uh, than anything else while fleshing out these characters. So in Tara's, I think it was uh, uh, the Tara, I hope the Tara which I imagined uh, was uh, is the one who is liked and appreciated by everyone. But I really think she is uh, been neglected, she's been ignored. Not her entire importance in the decision making. I mean, to these important in the situation itself. I mean, we talk about Sugri, but who is Sugri? I mean, Sugri was completely in the shadow of Ram. It was Tara who diffused. Sugri didn't have the courage to face Lakshman. And neither did her grief was so much that she cursed Ram. You know, so he didn't have a brother's grief, neither did he have the uh, the courage to. So, I mean, these two things have been 
sort of concentrated in this one character, which we tend to sort of uh, not see. It's completely almost uh, in invisible in the whole Kishkin, the episode. It's, it's only we only talk about, not even one of them, we just talk about Wali, Suguri, Hanuman. But we don't talk about, we forget the woman who was there, Ruan Tara. Um, is there any particular message you hope readers will take away from the book? No, because I thought, I honestly, I don't believe in messages. I think because the whole point of all these stories of, is not to judge at all. It's basically to think and try to understand and empathize. Even if it's a negative character or a positive character, the whole thing is not, there is no message here. What message can I give? I mean, it's the story of a girl who is totally cornered, where she has to, where she has a, you know, it, she, she suffers a certain disappointment in love when she, she definitely, uh, the man she marries is not definitely the man, the husband, the, the, you know, the disappointment of love in a husband, what you find, the, he, how she sees him changing before her eyes. His arrogance, he's sort of a precursor to what actually Ravan was. Wali and Sugri. Now, Sugri, it is like she sort of uh, corner sandwiched between his arrogance, Wali's arrogance, and his desire, uh, uh, Sugri's desire for her. So, uh, handling two extremely volatile and negative emotions like ego and desire, and trying to maintain the peace in the family, not only in the family, in the land she, conquer, she rules. I think it's amazing. I mean, that is what I mean. That's what we keep all women do, no? I mean, we're trying to juggle work and home. We're trying to juggle relationship. I mean, it's a master passion. She was a master in uh, the juggling, uh, handling relationship. I mean, this whole thing of keeping peace without, you know, this whole thing of like, at at a lot of personal cost. I mean, uh, if you actually see, she marries a man who is responsible for her husband's death. She marries Sugri, she marries a brother in law. This whole thing of uh, the message, I can only think of. I, I, there was no message that says, I was actually just telling a story. But the message is definitely this. I would just say that, that uh, whether it's uh, Tara or whether it's Satyavati, whether it's Urmila or Menka, I mean, these are the stories of women who had certain hardships and how they, if not overcome the hardship, they definitely battled it. The battle with a certain dignity, with a certain honesty, with or ahilya, with a certain conviction, and I think uh, that is what uh, women are made of. I mean, when you say a woman is made of steel, I think I think she becomes stronger. The more problems she has, I think the stronger she becomes. I think it, it's, it's a very thing. And women, I think, are faced. Girls are faced with this from the time they not not only from the time they are born. I mean, it's a constant struggle. I mean, if you see a life of a girl and you see a life of a uh, I mean, it's the history of women, if you see, and uh, you see the entire journey of an average girl in, uh, I wouldn't even say it, uh, just in India, anywhere around. It's like you have to, that whole thing of the inner strength we talk about it because she's faced with all these things much early in life. A simple thing like when they say girls multitask. I think girls multitask, women tend to multitask because Hindu, we are supposed to do that. We are supposed to do study and do your house chores. You are supposed to handle this. You know, this whole thing comes naturally. A boy is not supposed to do that because he's not been socially conditioned to do that. He's not socially expected to do that. So the expectations and uh, societal expectations and uh, uh, pressure is all sort of handled by the woman. So I think she does it beautifully right from the age of what, five till uh, from the moment she what she comes to a comes to a senses or whatever is growing up. I mean, she really, I mean, she's dead. So I think um, I wouldn't say it's a message. It's just a story of another strong woman. Really well said, ma'am. And finally, uh, what is your biggest piece of advice for aspiring writers? To write. <laughs> Honestly, yes, to write and to read also. I mean, I think you need to read a lot because with the, without reading. You know, I think you cannot evolve as a writer. Honestly, that is my personal frank opinion. Uh, you have to read, not because through these authors, different authors you read from different languages, from different worlds, you are exposed to so many things. You know, the, it not just doesn't improve your 
let's say your language and your vocabulary it also in, in, is sort of uh, uh, you are exposed to a different culture you are uh, exposed to different thought you are different exposed to different philosophy which you are supposed to absorb and assimilate and i think that helps uh, helps you to write so i think uh, aspiring writer need to read a lot and of course write a lot definitely write a lot as a discipline you have to write every day whether you do you might not like it the next day you can delete it and rewrite it but learn to write you know, on a daily basis whatever it is that was incredibly insightful ma'am thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today thank you so much thank you sorry for all the interruptions and the dog barking because i cannot keep my dog outside because she keeps whimpering so right hello good evening ma'am can i may i uh, ask a question yeah or make a comment mm -hmm. okay thank you so much for the opportunity i am dr vidya vishnathan from kerala ma'am mm -hmm. first of all i would like to uh, uh, express my gratitude to yeah. the organizers for having given us this opportunity and then ma'am i'm extremely glad to have met you even though online i'm mm -hmm. glad that i could see you listen to you actually listen to you speak it's such a wonderful experience and um, i i was spellbound by reading one of your works that is ahilya's awakening mm -hmm. and i had even uh, presented a research article uh, based on that uh, particular work in at uh, nit suratkal Mm -hmm. what i would like to know is uh, of course as you have mentioned you have brought in contemporary sensibilities uh, in your works mm -hmm. and of course you also offer a very distinct perspective uh, from a feminist framework i would say mm -hmm. what i would like to know is ma'am mm -hmm. challenged or critiqued presenting ahilya as a kind of a revolutionary character because while i was reading that novel i delved uh, deeper into the character of ahilya and uh, i mm -hmm. and as you also know ma'am there are also temples built in the name of ahilya ahilya is treated at some places as a goddess and mm -hmm. uh, when we live in india as you have mentioned in the uh, at, in the beginning where myth mm -hmm. and religion mm -hmm. are are, uh, are uh, cannot be easily separated in such a scenario writing on uh, writing on ahilya as a character who dares to express her sexuality or who voices uh, her needs her physical needs to be very explicit mm -hmm. uh, so such kind of a writing has it uh, have you um, i mean have you had to listen to any critiques for presenting this mythological character in this uh, modern feminist perspective see ahilya's character i think i don't think i made it very modern or feminist i think it was originally like that The original story is that she knows that it is in there, and she still goes ahead with it. The story, uh, yeah. Sorry. But but uh, very often, ma'am, when I went through the, I of course we have got uh, different types of um, alternate narratives are there. So when mm -hmm. I went to most of them, say that she was deceived into believing that it was Gautama. Uh, many of them present her like that, as if uh, you know, uh, uh, projecting the fact that she is chased or she is innocent because it happened unknowingly. but in your work ma'am you make it very explicit that she says i was responding to the call of life within me yes to quote and quote it was almost like that and so that so it is such a it is it is a revolutionary kind of a, a, a of an expression that women in india in yeah. culture bound india we were speaking about sexuality is still considered taboo and it yeah. is in that you have created a space to express Uh, even the physical needs of women, even though she is a, a, a wife as well as a mother. And ma'am, another point that I have observed is this work can also can can it also be considered as a critique of womanhood from the Indian scenario, because uh, she actually wanted to become a rishika, right, ma'am? Mm -hmm. And then she mentions that because she got married, she took up the responsibilities of becoming a wife. and of course tending to the requirements of uh, maintaining the ashram uh, providing food and other essentials for all the students in the ashram she hardly could find the time to study and it is these responsibilities that weigh her down and it it is that which uh, uh, make her lose hope in becoming a rishika mm -hmm. 
right ma'am yeah. is it, is it, can be considered as a critique of the life of women as a wife and mother yes definitely and i think this is the story again as said of any any woman who is trying to juggle uh, who has very often to give up her dreams and ambitions and career for uh, yes. uh, definitely familial responsibilities so uh, here again i was trying to insert uh, there was an undercurrent of the problem uh, the prevalent problem of you know the dilemma a woman faces every girl faces you know when she marries you know this actually if you see a girl is always conflicted first is the education when she is the education which stream to take uh, which would help a career is she allowed to have a career when she gets married is she allowed to have a uh, uh, can she work after marriage then if she wants to have a child how is it going to affect her career so i think the constant dilemmas a uh, a girl or slash woman has to face it's continuous so i think uh, ailia story is a little like that in the sense of course uh, the whole uh, when we talk about ailia we you know it's ailia story is powerful because you know in a second she changes from a devoted wife and she becomes condemned as a promiscuous woman so i think that is what we remember ailia for so i mean her story is not just about the infidelity uh, which is accused of but it also shows the duty of a man you know what does the duty of a husband towards his wife so when you're talking about uh aile and gautam there was something there was a problem in the marriage and that is what it, uh, the, the situation leads to i mean any i mean we, we are quick to i mean that is why i think the biggest villain was the society where they quick to judge a woman very fast and say okay she is a promiscuous woman and she, she was a, she was unfaithful to husband and she has to be punished for it so i think this whole sense of punishment that whole anger against the woman that she needs to be punished i think that is the story of ailia so when we are talking about uh, uh, she becoming a rishika it's not about uh, ailia's sexual desires it's about all her desires we're talking about women's desires her desire which is sort of suppressed which is sort of trampled upon right from the beginning i mean for everything she has to fight i mean here she wants to be she wants to become a rishika she her desire for education for higher knowledge is sort of nipped in the bud with she falls in love and she marries this man she hopes that being married uh, marrying this man she, you know it would be a parallel thing but it doesn't happen so because then she gets she becomes a mother she has children so i think this again is just i think it is a straight reflection of today's of, uh, of any modern woman who has faces this dilemmas every single day i mean it's like uh, people used to ask me uh, uh you know this whole thing about uh, uh when you're going for work uh, what is your priority work or children i said no i think i should just take the priority as uh, as uh, as to face it as the day comes sometimes the work used to give i should be priority to work and sometimes if my child is sick or suddenly is fallen i have to give uh, keep my work away and go uh, look after my child so i think this sort of a dilemma uh the sort of uh, what do you say conflicts are an everyday thing and it that everyday thing becomes a normal thing so they have normalized this sort of and it has become the uh, you know the sort of the onus falls on the woman to handle it so i think ahile the whole thing was there was also a question i think the last part of the book is also the you know the question of what gautam's role in there we are talking about ahile and her uh, transgressions but what about gautam's transgressions Yes, ma'am. Ah, uh, Namaste, ma'am. Thank you. Are you I, able to hear I, me? I think, I think, I think, Ayila was the most uh, out of all the books. I think Ayila was a reflection of uh, truly the, the the problems of a modern woman. You know, uh, whether it's uh, talking about a sexuality, talking about a sexual desire, sort of, uh, you know, uh, which is something as you said very rightly, which is still uh, considered taboo. You cannot. I mean, how many of the husband uh, husband wife relationship? Uh, uh sexually uh, satisfying you know all these problems uh, definitely and they are the core of uh, the husband wife relationship marital relationship and we tend to just overlook it you know the, the whole thing is sort of the marriage and that again is the problem of today's world girls are stepping out from these uh, they have crossed the threshold they are breaking ceiling they are so 
there are different set of problems which the girl is facing first. So I think uh, it's sort of, uh, I think Ayala sort of was uh, emblematic of all uh, modern girls and women, I think. OK, ma'am. Thank Namaste, you so ma much. Thank you so much. Uh, Namaste, ma'am. Uh, am I audible? Do I have mm -hmm. time uh, for a simple question, ma'am? Mm -hmm. uh, ma'am, this yeah. is Radha from Chennai. Oh, yes. Hello, Radha. Hello, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, I have answers for many of the questions which we had spoken in detail. Now, mm -hmm. I was literally taken, uh, I, I mean, it was so nice to hear Hmm. A woman is not a woman's enemy. That was important. That was definitely important. And patriarchy is just a thought. These two sentences are something novel that I feel because always this term patriarchy, patriarchy, you made it very light. So it is just a thought. It's just a thought which probably women have to come out of. So thank you for those two beautiful sentences, ma'am. And uh, um, ma'am, I have one quick question. Ma'am, whose original works do you follow? It's the Valmiki's and uh, from there, uh, because you said it's uh, this Tara Strews is mostly fiction. Definitely it had to be because we have only two episodes of Tara. Yeah. Many of us, yeah. This is mostly fiction and Urvi is, uh, Urvi is, we discussed earlier, Urvi yes, is it's totally fiction. Yes. yes. And there, uh, we had discussed earlier, it is a kind of reflection. She is a kind of reflection for Karna. Now, mm -hmm. do I also call Tara as a reflection? No, definitely okay. she was there. She was definitely not a reflection. She was definitely like Mandodari. I think she was always telling her. She was the guide and the philosopher and the conscience of her husband. When she knew her husband was yeah. airing, both of them, whether it was Mandodari, whether it was Tara, they are warning. But the, that for ah. both people, they are not is the thing of wise words are never listened to. So I think there, if the wife was a symbol of wisdom and a warning, uh, uh, mm. I think uh, the, the man, the man, uh, it was just ego and arrogance. So uh, it was not definitely not a reflection. She definitely, the characters are there. They are warning. They are trying to tell their husband that what you're doing is wrong. You're going okay. the wrong way. You're sort of, it's, it's, not, it's not just a word of caution. Uh, it is, they know what, you know, it, the wisdom is there is not just a warning. They know what is going to happen, what, 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 right. what, what the consequences will be, which right. because of the arrogance and their power and the ego, they fail to see. And despite it's having such wise, despite having such wise wives, they, yes, they, 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 did, they, they did, they did, they did go to, uh, they did uh, walk the path of destruction. So, and death. So I think uh, Tara definitely is not like Urvi. Urvi was a fictitious. Urvi. But Tara, Tara, exactly. That's what I'm trying to say. Tara's wisdom is so important. I mean, even when dying, Wali realizes that. And then he tells Urvi that. that please listen to her. Because uh, she is actually, uh, her role is completely been uh, sidelined uh, in this whole war between the two brothers and you know the fight for the throne and whatever. But I think right. her role has been completely actually subjugated. Right. I personally equate uh, Saraswati to knowledge and wisdom. So here I can again equate uh, Tara to wisdom. Am I mm -hmm. correct, Swan? Yes, that okay if I look at. Yes, okay. wisdom and a certain, and you know, and overall maturity, you know, to. Uh, there is a difference between, uh, uh, there's a word called, uh, there's a very lovely word in English called sagacity. Yeah, you, know, you have to be sagacious. It's not just wisdom. You know, it's very being uh, sagacious. The person who is also very extremely practical, who realizes that it's not just philosophical wisdom or pearls of wisdom we are talking about. Here we are talking about sagacity. Is a person who sees, uh, compares facts with uh, a, a certain reality and reacts in a real way. You know, that is what a sagacious person is usually because he knows the consequences. And uh, he tries to warn the person, the, the people around them about that. So when you say, like in history, you hear this word, sagacious skin. I think the Tara mm -hmm. was such a sagacious woman. She was more than a white woman. She was a sagacious woman, actually. Yes. OK, ma'am. So the synonym for Tara is now sagacious from me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, thank you very much, ma'am. One more that question. Uh, you went back to Valmiki's Ramayana. 
do I infer it that way? Valmiki is now minor for those two episodes because Ulvi, <laughs> as you, Ulvi was also very little. You do not have a background. Probably there's one summer, uh, only one summer drama, right? Or no, and the, 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 there were I heard, saw a lot of um, there were a lot of story like in I think one of the stories yeah. that when she confronts Lakshman, she sort of is drunk and all. I mean this whole thing I was. Not very sure about the drunk part, you know. That she's okay. also part of the she's also part of the revelry. And now, why would mm-hmm. she be part of a revelry of her husband's death? You know, you know that whole. Uh, uh, so you know, it's like I sort of filter what information I have, whatever research I have. Okay. I sort of, but you know, because I have to make a believable character. She has, she has to be rational in her actions and her decisions. So I cannot show. Why would she be rejoicing while he's dead? Oh, even if right, she would be. Right. So uh, there, I would take it with a pinch of. I said, okay, um, this is uh, this is one this is one story I've heard. There are a lot of other, uh, what do you say? You know, the folk stories and uh, the different threads which you get to know. Not only Tara, the yeah. other characters. So it is like I try to join the dots with a certain uh, rational, uh, a certain reasonable. Uh, argument which I have in my mind and I try to play out the character accordingly. So mm, I think that's, that's, one are... thing which, that's one thing which differentiates you, right, ma'am? That, that's how I infer you <laughs> as an ardent fan. As you say, there may be knowledge, but I see no wisdom. Probably you're trying to see the wisdom from some women. <laughs> Thank you for giving us those wisdom. Ma'am. We'll see progress, we'll see achievement, we'll see expertise. <laughs> Maybe after the India Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Good evening, ma'am. Hello, yeah. ma'am. Good evening. May I, ask, may I ask a few questions, ma'am? Definitely. First of all, good evening, ma'am. Good evening again. I would like to express my gratitude for your presence in today's session. Uh, I'm a PhD scholar, ma'am, and I'm doing a post-feminist study of your uh, novels. Mm-hmm. Uh, ma'am, first of all, I would like like uh, your perspective on Tara's truce. I just finished uh, reading that novel, and there is a lot of discussion on uh, gender fluidity in that novel. Mm-hmm. So, ma'am, uh, mythology in our country is, I mean, it is the basis of our behavior, culture, religion, and almost everything. It is omnipresent. Mm-hmm. And there is a lot of, uh, I mean, discussion of gender fluidity in our mythology. Mm-hmm. Then, ma- then, ma'am, I want to know your perspective on this. Why do you feel like it is still a taboo? Why us as Indians, we don't appreciate gender fluidity. We are not accepting it. I think because these stories, as you say, the stories of gender fluidity of transgenders or LGBTQ were not being told. They were after a point of time, the stories were stopped being told in this very very simply put, because we don't know about them. For the for many it's a revelation when you hear about characters like Dikanti or uh, let's say Bodh or Ila, you know, all of these characters. Uh, everything is a revelation because these stories have not been uh, part of the uh, uh, mainstream narrative. So I think these stories were buried for whatever reason, I think socio-cultural, political reasons, uh, because of certain, let's say, uh, the taboo came because of, I think, uh, just like patriarchy, I think uh, just like patriarchy affected women badly, I think affected these, uh, the, the, these causes also. So this whole thing, then uh, this, uh, 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 we were talking about foreign rules also. So, you know, they considered this to be not normal. So it was taboo. So I think it got reflected. It's the state of uh, the, the way we treated courtesans and devdasi. You know, they were definitely not uh, prostitutes, what the English felt, the colonial people did, felt them to be or treated them. And that's how they completely stripped them of all the dignity and uh, status. So I think it happened with this uh, also. I think these stories were never told to be, uh, you know, to be told and uh, to be proud of, to be know that it is very much part of our society for it to be, uh, you know, the whole thing has to be, because when you talk about society, we talk about everything. It has to be inclusive. These stories were not inclusive. So I think it just became, they got buried and they were almost dead these stories. It's now, again, suddenly people have started getting aware and I think it's wonderful that you realize that we are discovering all these characters. So I think uh, writing about uh, 
this particular character was uh, a revelation for me also because uh, uh, you know this um, transgender, the fluidity we are talking about. Usually, transgenders are not fluid. Uh, the, the whole thing about uh, this particular character, he wants to become a woman again because he has done his duties as a father, as being the chief of a tribe, and he wants to become the woman again. He wants it. That's why he retired. So I think that was the most beautiful part, where he goes back to his roots. He's, and uh, uh, he's a, he, he can do that, but there are many people who are trapped in that. So, so, so the whole thing about uh, these stories are not be, were not being told because I think they just got, as I said, they just got uh, uh, completely sidelined and they were buried. They were just buried for, uh, as I said, for social reason, political reason, cultural reason. They just got buried and they were not mentioned at all. So they are, I mean, actually, if you see, they, it's such a rich, uh, uh, there's so many stories, it's just not one random story which we are talking about. There is a, there are so many characters if you actually see. So uh, the fact that we are talking about about them now, it's, I think that itself is a it's, a, it's a, it's 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 a revelation for many. But more than that, I think that surprise is that oh, these story, these people existed. You know? Yes. So, so that I think, uh, well, that shows. I mean, I think it it should it should be a more introspective question that why did we behave badly as society and ill treat them. Why have we done that? I think it's a question which we should need to answer ourselves and be, as I said, when I when I talk about sisterhood, I think it's humanist. You know, because we are humans, we have to give the respect, we, we have to respect humanity. We are different races, we are different species, we are different. Uh, the whole idea is being inclusive as a society. So I think, uh, if that was propagated that time, and so why not do it now? Why are we not doing it all? Because as you said, the storage has got, it got sort of, it was kept in a deep freeze for some time, for so many thousands of years. And now again, it's sort of coming out. So, and now we are uh, uh, sort of rediscovering a new, whole new world of them. That these people were there and that was, uh, we have uh, Mohini, we have characters like Mohini. No, we worship them. It's not only just character. They are, uh, again, as I said, there are characters for a reason. There are stories. Each character has a story behind them, or her, or they. So the whole, when we are talking about the LGBTQ community, uh, I mean, there are so many uh, examples, so many stories behind them, which we, can, if they can do it, why cannot we learn from them? Why can't we do that? And on the story is very simple. The bottom line is very simple, that you have to be inclusive. They have to be, they are part of us, sir. they are, because they, we are all humans. If man and women are two part of a species, all of us are part of a, we are part of the human race. So if you are talking about tribes and races and also, I think uh, the whole idea was, that is exactly what they were trying to say. The, uh, there is a certain unity in the diversity, you know, that the unity only comes if you have, you feel that sense of, uh, uh, what do you say, brotherhood, the sense, the sense of sisterhood, the, the sense of a, a, a humanistic approach, the whole sense of being inclusive. So I think these stories, basically the bottom line is, is that, that they were part of the society, main society. And why, and why we sort of rejected these, uh, uh, them is, it is our fault. Because of our ignorance, our uh, prejudices, and our, I think, basic uh, apathy. Right, ma'am. And it, it is indeed a revelation to read such stories that it there were so many of them present and, you know, like... Yes, because, to from them, and not, not, one, and not one story is like the other. Each one is different. Yes. Each one has its own story. So if you go, go and study each of them, actually, I would love each, of one, of, each one of you to go on that. The sensitivity of those stories, you know. I so love the Buddha part, ma'am, that intellect, it represents intellect and intellect is genderless. I love that part. And I didn't know that before that. He, our mythology also talks about Buddha in that way. Yes. So, it, it was a revelation for me. Yes, the whole thing of, uh, I mean, the whole story of Tara, like Tara and Chandra and this whole, I mean, so that's why I def, uh, deliberately uh, had a parallel story of uh, that other Tara because she was so connected with Buddha. And yes. uh, again, that whole uh, element of the transgender. So the thing is, what are you trying to say? In the end, we are all part. We are just 
different faces, different bodies, but we're all the same. So. Right. Ma'am, uh, another question. Uh, Ma'am, did you consciously thought about becoming a feminist author or you were just interested in uh, storytelling? And if yes, uh, what uh, surprises you or frustrates you about feminist theory and how does it show up in your work? Oh, the, what frustrates me about feminist uh, femi uh, is that feminism has become a bad word. It really it, it, uh, annoys me to the point of being, however, yes, if you're not a feminist, you're not a humanist, simple. If you cannot respect women, you're not a humanist. It's very simple. What is feminism about? Feminism about is giving equal rights and respect as a, uh, if you're giving, uh, if a man has uh, de 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 certain respect and rights, Give it to the women also. That's what the women are asking for. It is not about reverse sexism. It is not about men bashing at all. Men and women have to have a symbiotic life. But for that, if you want equal, if you want to have a happy life, you have to give them equal respect and rights. Yes. And that is what feminism about. If you do, if you, I mean, that is what uh, angers me the most. That throughout the women of history, uh, thing, women have been only created, uh, you know, just because she just be a person, a vessel of procreation. She is a means of. Uh, she she is a she is a she is a homemaker. She is supposed to uh, do the duties of a wife and a mother. I mean, but we forget that she is a woman also. You know, we just give a role that she's a daughter, she's a wife, she's a daughter-in-law, she's a mother. But what we always forget that she's a woman in the first place. And woman is the counterpart of a man. Do we see man as a son, as a brother-in-law, as a father-in-law? No, we don't see all that. We see him as a man. He's a contributor, he's a breadwinner. That's all we see about. We see man in a such a unidimensional way. And then in a multidimensional way, we see a woman. But we don't see her as a woman. We give her roles. So yes. that is what is feminism. What I'm trying to say, feminist author, of course, that the whole thing, the what irritates me about feminism because people do not understand what feminism is. Feminism is just respecting and giving her the, there is a certain, this whole thing I'm talking about, sisterhood, empathy, helping each other, all this is feminism. Yes. Because I think if we are in living in a society of men and women, why are not women given the opportunities the rise, the respect which she is entitled to. She is not asking for the moon. I mean, it's very simple. She is not really asking for anything. She is just asking for what is hers, which has been, she has been deprived of. The, de the deprivation, the de 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 she has been deprived. Is, there's a, there's a, there has been consistent, systematic discrimination against this. That is what I'm talking about. I mean, if that is feminism, yes, of course. Feminism. The whole thing of, you know, people, and this, I hate this with feminazi. What do, what do you mean by feminazi? Just because a woman is just being a little raucous about it, you don't like it? It's too loud? Of course, yes, but many times it happens that the main points are not uh, sort of uh, considered at all. And we are talking about the cursory ones, actually, the cosmetic ones. But the main problem is exactly the women's education, women's rights, uh, a woman colleague, I mean, the way she has to her promotions. You want to talk about, you see women when you're working, you see all this happening around you. Women students, how many girls get an opportunity to study? How they have to fight at homes? So all these, I mean, this is part of the feminist movement in the sense uh, when I'm talking about feminism, I think, yes, it is a women's awakening. You have to, how will the society progress without a woman not progressing, without not giving her the right, not giving her the respect, and not giving the opportunities to do so. How will how will we move forward? You just uh, what you just said, like uh, it. Um, you just spoke about individual empowerment, agency, autonomy against radical feminism. What I got from you just said it is very much the ideals of post feminism or the backlash that. No, see, uh, see, well, you know what happens. The whole thing about feminism is sort of uh, confused it with the Western definition. See, they fought their own wars. Yes. We have to, as our thing, we have to fight our own wars. What I am trying to say in today's world, whether it's an urban girl, woman or it's a rural woman, basic rights like education. She has been killed at birth. There's infanticide, there's feticide. There are pockets in the country now where there are no women there. There are only men. 
you are completely yes. twisting the balance of a woman and a man, woman man ratio. And that is the level of murders you are doing. We are living in that sort of a society. Okay, we are talking about an urban society. We talk about a woman. See the way a, the parents treat a girl and the, the or uh, treat bring up a girl and bring up a boy. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. it's very it's very nuanced, but yes. it is visible. It yes. is very much there, and I see yes. it in the most polished, the rich, affluent, educated families. It is not about it is as I said. Now it is all social conditioning. And social conditioning is sort of brainwashing. You don't realize it's unconscious brainwashing where we believe where everything is normalized. So I really, I mean, uh, a girl trying to, you know, this whole thing of uh, a girl being ambitious, then she becomes mercenary. In the a girl is not supposed to ambitious, be ambitious about her career. Why not? Why? What are you making her study for? Just to be make her more mar uh, uh, qualified in the mar mar marriageable market, I don't understand this. The education is it's just a tool for her to choose her career. I mean, these sort of things, you know, because most of so many of the families are just educating the girl so that okay, she's a what BSc, MSc, whatever, whatever, so that they, it shows well on a what do you say, a matrimonial uh, resume. It's ridiculous, even in today's world. So. The whole thing of empowering a woman with education, with a career, with finance. There are so many women who, despite earning money, do not realize the financial power and capabilities they have. Take, right. the, exa take the example of your health. She is earning money. She is looking after her family. But does she realize the importance and the impact of the money she is earning? No. She will still take she'll suffer an alcoholic husband, she will take his bruising, she will take domestic violence, but she will not leave him because, though she's financially capable of doing that, because obviously the alcoholic husband is not doing, earning anything besides uh, eating into her money, actually. But this sort of, this this happens because of a certain social conditioning which is there. So when you're talking about feminism, we don't even realize this. So feminism, yes, is uh, people don't like that word because I think it is a threat to all this uh, conservative and uh, a certain thinking which we have uh, assumed for so many centuries. So I think definitely people fear the word and hate that word. But yes, it's very sad that it's been twisted. But I think, I think very, I know, very simple, uh, you know, very, very uh, stripped of all the prejudices. And I think what it actually means is giving a woman her chance, her opportunities, the right and the respect which she is entitled to. Very simple. Right, right. It was really enlightening you to, you know, know your views on feminism from the author herself. I'm just one last question, ma'am. Uh, what's next for your work? I mean, you have talked about, uh, I think, all the topics, sisterhood you just mentioned, motherhood, uh, marriage, um, you know, career, education, uh, career, career um, uh, you highlighted the importance of education and career through a Ahalya and, you know, a lot of, I mean, uh, I can see every aspect of womanhood in your novels, but uh, what is the theme or subject or topic that you keep coming back to? What's next for you? No, it's always about women and her, let's say, her struggles, her triumphs, her tears, I think it's all about that. I think it's through different characters, be it Ahilya, be it uh, uh, Tara, be it even Saraswati. I mean, the way Saraswati, she did not endorse marriage or motherhood, which are the two sort of pillars of what a woman is defined with. But uh, still, I mean, so I think all the, I, there are so many issues. I mean, I, uh, yes. But right. is there a particular issue that you keep coming back to that this needs to be discovered more? This this I will talk about more. No, is I think no, no, I think it depends completely on the character. I think my next book okay. I'm writing on is Hidimba. Okay. So I think it completely depends on the character whom I'm writing. And then all the points suffers. Like uh, with Saraswati, it was about education. Yes. It was basically uh, the opportunities to education which women uh, girls are completely deprived of. And they have such a hard uh, such a hard struggle to get education. So I think it was about not only about education, it was about things like uh, your periods, you know, about the entire definition of womanhood, of motherhood, of 
uh, being a wife, marriage, you know, marriage and motherhood versus uh, the choice of not marrying and having being a mother. So I think uh, if Saraswati was that, uh, Tara was, I think, basically, again, uh, this whole concept of, uh, here I think I also talked about the jungle, the world of the jungle, the forest versus yes. uh, the uh, man and society. So I think it depends on each character. Satyavati you now I think was definitely where uh, women politicians are maligned, you know, like they, they always say, oh, they're very ambitious, they're very mercenary, they're very ruthless. But you forget politician, male politicians are equally bad. So again, I say power is again genderless. Whenever whoever is in power, whether it's a man or a woman, the person is going to abuse it. So Satyavati, when she gets her power, she did abuse it. So here I was trying to say, uh, show Satyavati as genuinely the most politically powerful person, woman she was. She was more than Dhruva. Like people say Draupadi was the most powerful character. But I think Satyavati was the most politically powerful person in the Mahabharata, actually, and how he actually wielded power. So, so I think it depends on the issue. So every time I come, keep coming back to is I think actually the woman's struggle, you know, how she fights it out. Because that is the spirit which should not be broken. That you should not be a broken woman. And there are stories of uh, uh, they are crushed women, but they fight back. You know, so, so, so I always keep coming back to that because circumstances and experiences make them cow down, but they don't get cowed down. You know, the whole thing, the whole amazing part is that the fight is their spirit to fight back. So I think that I keep coming back to that. That woman, it's a continuous battle for her. I think so. You just mentioned Satyavati, and the highlight for me in that novel was the title, Fisher Queen's Dynasty. Yeah. I mean, the titles are so fascinating. Saraswati's Gift, Fisher Queen's Dynasty, Sita's Sister. How do I, how do you come up with the, such titles? They're so catchy. And I mean, the title itself says a lot of things. It was Fisher Queen's Dynasty. Yes, so ironically. Meet Sita's Sister. We yeah. don't know her by any other, you know, relations. So how do, what is the process behind that? Nothing, I think, uh, and I'm having a tough time thinking of Hidimba as a character actually. And this apostrophe has really become sort of a brand name. Uh, but uh, more than anything, uh, I try to, uh, it should define that character. Like Minka's choice, you know, it's like, I think if, uh, if she had not decided to reveal the truth to Vishwamitra, she could have led a happy life. Yes. You know, that sort of thing, that one particular decision which she makes, uh, and uh, which I think was an extremely noble decision. And uh, I think this sort of generosity of spirit is not uh, associated with uh, an Apsara. An Apsara is supposed to be just sultry seductresses who, selfish uh, seductresses who do their job and go off. But you know, this sort of, uh, the, the title has to sort of define, sort of describe, or at least uh, sort uh, say something about that character which I'm talking about, the, the protagonist I'm talking about. So I, Tara's truce, like people were wondering what, I said, yes, the whole life with her, actually it becomes a truce for her. She has to make peace, not only with the people around her, but with herself. The right. truce is also an internal truce which she has to accept. And that is what we do. We, I think we, we lead such life. We have to, there's so many truces we have to make and sacrifice it. That is what life, life is ups, down, plus, minus, so. Excuse me, ma'am, our time for questions is almost over. Yeah, it's almost, I mean, I'm thank just saying so the much. time. I just yeah. wanted to say thank you so much, ma'am, for answering all my questions so patiently, so gracefully. Thank you to the organizers. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you very much. A lot of time. Yeah. I'm thank really you, ma'am. Sorry, sorry for all the interruptions here, yeah. but uh, that is what happened when you're, you're not in an office and what, when you're not in a lecture hall. So forgive me, our dog, forgive all the calls for whatever. So I hope you had a good time and I hope I could answer all your questions. If you have still have any more questions and doubts, you can always contact me on social media. And thanks again for an opportunity to mingle with you all. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am, for joining us. I think it's time to move on to the conclusion. For that, I invite Reshmi to deliver her words. 
Good evening all. My name is Rishmi Chandran from first year MA English. On this wonderful evening, I would like to present word of thanks. On behalf of the PG Department of English, I extend my sincere gratitude to our HOD Dr. Anjana J for the constant support in all our endeavors. A special thanks to our chief guest Kavita Kane for accepting our invitation and for being here with us today in spite of her busy schedule. Your words have truly inspired us. Thank you ma'am for your stimulating and captivating words. Special thanks to all the PhD scholars and students from other colleges who were interacted with ma'am. My sincere gratitude to all the teachers, coordinators, audience for gracing the occasion and participating in the interactive session. Once again, thanks to all of you and have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Rashmi. And uh, now the session is over. Have a great day.